Hi everyone, this is your mini lecture on feminist and gender theory. The two are not the same thing, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what is feminist theory and then how gender theory also is differentiated. This is a very brief lecture. You can simply just listen to it. You don't even need to watch it if you want to take notes or you want to listen to it uh, as something just as you're walking around, things like that. So let's get to the basics. So femini feminism is defined as any attempt to contend with patriarchy in its many manifestations. Patriarchal power rests on social meaning given to biological sexual difference. So let's unpack that a little bit. So I got this from the Rutledge Critical Dictionary of Feminism and Post-Feminism from 2000. So some of the words that I use here are patriarchy. Now patriarchy is not meant to denigrate men individually. Uh, patriarchy says that there is a representation of male dominance and male power written into the power structure of a society. So that means it becomes a patriarchal culture. In that patriarchal culture, what could happen is that women are seen as what's called the second sex. They are not men, therefore they are not powerful. Right? The U.S. is decidedly in a patriarchal culture. There's no disputing any of that. So the fact that patriarchal power rests on social meaning means that it becomes part of history and part of the culture that's created this idea of what is powerful. Is masculine power represented in a variety of ways like the strength and body of an individual? How do we see that manifesting itself in the texts surrounding us in our culture? And a text can be anything. It can be visual. It can be a movie. It can be a series of words that are tweeted out in that representation. So when we're talking about sex, we're not talking about the verb, we're talking about the noun. So we're talking about biological sexual difference. That means that it's whatever is the body parts that are there. So patriarchal power relies on that social meaning created about the biological sexual difference. So again, referring back to that binary of man-woman, if we were to create a hierarchy of that binary, in U.S. culture, man, in general, is articulated as being higher on that hierarchy. Okay, We can debate a little bit of the nuances of that once we get to class. So what happens when we have a dominant tradition that is based on sexual biological difference? then we have to start asking ourselves, what about gender? And gender is not based on biology. Gender is based on individual performance of masculine and feminine traits. So here we have two more concepts, masculinity and femininity. So masculine traits in U.S. culture, I think we can spell those out, and we'll do that in class. What are feminists' traits that are spelled out in U.S. culture. Which one is articulated as powerful and which one is articulated as not powerful or weak as the converse? Okay, in U.S. culture, patriarchy dictates that to be female, not just to be woman, but to be female, this includes anybody who's transgen transgender or um, LGBTQ, to be female or to enact feminine qualities is being what's called other. It's being called lesser. So it's, you're not the primary individual who's creating uh, social structure and culture. Right? Okay. Feminism is about power struggles. It articulates and investigates how women are portrayed. This is feminist theory who's the author of that portrayal. And remember, when we talk about authorship here, we're talking about a lot of different creative acts. We're not just talking about the person who writes things down. Think about Marlowe as being an author of a narrative in Heart of Darkness. We're also looking at what ideologies are present. Now, what is an ideology? An ideology is a really pervasive 
way to articulate um, social and cultural ideas all together. It's a discourse that's all together. And it's not that everybody agrees upon it, it, that it just becomes subsumed into that culture. Now, when these ideologies are present, how, how can those possibly be subversive? Because there's not one dominating or governing ideology. We have all different kinds of groups all over the U.S. And we're not talking politics here. We're talking social structures and cultural structures as well. Feminist theory believes in the politics related to the body, meaning the individual biological body, how it's constructed, how it's, it's viewed, how it's articulated, how it's disenfranchised. Uh, it's not simply related to gender for feminist theory. It's grounded in identity politics and combined with sexuality, race, culture, and religion. So this means that feminist theory, and from here on out for the rest of the semester, you can combine it with any of the theories that we've been doing. So Marxist feminism, post-structural feminism, that's all going to use semiotics, formalism, and possibly new criticism a little bit, if you can see your way to that. There are two concerns in general with feminist theory, how women are represented in writing, in literature, in visual culture, and who controls that writing. And if it's from the perspective of a woman author, this is feminist theory, remember, what is the ideology that's underlying it? You can't say that all women are feminists politically or culturally or even as a theory and a, and a critic. You can't simply look at the representation of women and women's bodies in Heart of Darkness or any piece of literature and say, let's see how it's being um, undermined or how it's being. Instead, you could look at it in terms of, well, what's the power structure and where is it coming from? And I say this because as we start to identify where we can use feminist theory, the purpose of feminist theory is not to simply identify women who are powerful. We look at the ideology and the power structure that those women characters enact. We also, as part of doing gender theory, is take a look how masculine and feminist work, uh, our ideas are being interrogated in terms of that character or the visual aspect. All right. Strategies for the application of feminist theory and gender theory. Consider the significance of the author and the character's gender. How are sexual stereotypes reinforced or undermined? Does it reflect, alter, or complicate the place or construction of women and men in society. And here's one just to do as a thought process. Imagine yourself reading the work or a text or looking at a piece of art from the perspective of a woman. And my question is, are we really able to see that perspective from another gender point of view? And by the way, there are more than two genders. Everybody realize that? Okay, 2020, we are realizing that, okay. Just a couple more things in this one. I'm going through my notes. Some key concepts that I want you to think about when you're thinking about feminist theory and gender theory. What you're looking at is um, a representation of trying to look at issues surrounding women characters as being victims or being autonomous and responsible or if they're being reactionary. One of the things that you have to look at is that there are going to be several points of identity with each character. This is just one of them. You're going to look at biological sex and you're going to look at gender that's different. You don't need to do those two together. You can separate the two of them when you're doing your own writing. I'm trying to go slowly here through these things and not overwhelm everybody. Gracie is behind me. She's taking a little nap, thankfully. Okay, here's one other really important point. When we're talking about feminist theory and we're talking about the patriarchy, we want to leave emotion out of it. We want to leave um, accusations out of it. 
So you wouldn't say that a character is sexist because you're making a determination that will completely shut down a conversation. Instead, you would talk about the patriarchal representation through that character in either masculinist or feminist qualities that are set up in the culture of that piece of literature or that text. What you need to do is looking, look for the underlying structures of power, right? For feminist theory specifically, you want to look at how women's bodies are also treated. You also want to look for imagery that is used to suggest feminine qualities. For instance, in Heart of Darkness, Marlowe does talk a little bit about the jungle as she. So why is he doing that? And then there's also a deconstructionist point of view. Is he denigrating the jungle there? Or is he fearful of it, bringing in a little psychoanalysis and talking about the uncanny? He's both fearful of it and he's familiar with it, but he's also acknowledging its power over him, which might make him fearful. Okay, this one has gone on long enough. That's your real basics for feminist theory and gender theory. We'll talk about it in class a little bit more. But wait, there's more. I forgot to add one more thing. It's an important concept when we start to talk about gender theory specifically. There was a critic by the name of Judith Butler. She wrote a book in 1990 called Gender Trouble. And she approached this idea of gender theory a little bit differently. And here's a key concept for us. Gender is always performed. Gender and sexual identities are performed. She called this performativity. So here's what she says about it. Gender doesn't express an inner essence about the subject. She uses this notion of parity to establish a normative or a normal notion of gender and sexuality as compulsory or required as a way of revealing its fictitious nature. So performativity can be used in terms of something like perhaps uh, and it's in, it's usually intentional, used in perhaps in something like drag queens. So that's the biggest one that we know. Has anybody been wa watching RuPaul? I think it's on Hulu or Netflix. So think about that. What's being performed there? Masculinity, femininity, what about gender is being critiqued in that, in that particular moment? Performativity can be used to subvert, destabilize, or perpetuate received meanings and values about gender. Now, this is really important. And think about the Harlequin in Heart of Darkness. And remember, this is all part of gender theory. For Butler, gender isn't real. It's a set of boundaries that are politically regulated. It's gender isn't real. This is really interesting. What Butler is saying is that there's no authentic masculinity or femininity. There's no one definition of it. It keeps getting remade and redefined and revised in culture, but also in literature. So you'll find, like in Heart of Darkness, masculinity might be not necessarily overtly defined, but it is examples through the way that Buddha Marlowe speaks. But then, like with everything else, it changes as the novel goes along. It's more complicated because this is a retrospective narrative. So Buddha Marlowe ostensibly has had time to think about it, right? Okay, so you want to keep this in mind that gender is a fiction and it perpetuates society's narratives, meaning society's ideologies, that thing I talked about at the beginning of this video. That means that when we don't have a confirmed masculinity or femininity, then that means that it can change and shift, which is a beautiful thing in literature, uh, but it also can be very complex. All right, okay. For our purposes, we are not going to look at the masculinity, femininity, and bio biological sex of the author, Joseph Conrad. We're gonna stay within the text itself. We're gonna keep looking at the words. We're still gonna use our semiotics for our formalism and our new criticism. All right. All right. Now, this is the real ending. Me and Gracie, we say goodbye.